Chapter Twelve of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Her Country's Example. Do you know, my dear, Cynthia Maxwell is simply going to die with envy when she sees me in this. The plump little mistress of Government House, standing before a full-length mirror in her boudoir, surveyed herself with intense satisfaction. Her arms and neck burst startlingly from the clinging sheath of the incomparable doilet gown that was Jane Gerson's dossier for official protection. In the flood of morning light pouring through the mullioned windows, Lady Crandall seemed a pink and white, and somewhat florid, lily in bloom out of time. Hildebrand's buyer, on her knees with deft fingers busy with the soft folds of the skirt, answered through a mouthful of pins. "'Poor Cynthia! My heart goes out to her!' "'Oh, it needn't!' Lady Crandall answered, with a tilting of her strictly Iowa-style nose. "'The Maxwell person has made me bleed more than once here on the rock, with the gowns a fond mamma sends her from Paris. But, honestly, isn't it a bit low for a staid middle-aged person like myself? I'm afraid I'll have trouble getting my precious doulette past the censor." Lady Crandall plumed herself with secret joy. Jane looked up, puzzled. "'Oh, that's old Lady Porter, a perfect dragon,' the general's wife rattled on. "'Poor old dear, she thinks the Lord put her on the rock for a purpose. Her own collars get higher and higher. I believe, if she ever was presented at court, she'd emulate the old Scottish lady who followed the law of décolleté but preserved her self-respect by wearing a red flannel chest protector. You must meet her. "'I'm afraid I won't have time to get a look at your dragon,' Jane returned, with a little laugh, all happiness. "'Now that Sir George has promised me I can sail on the Saxonia Friday—' "'You really must.' The envious eyes of Lady Crandall fell on the pile of plans, potent Delphic mysteries to charm the heart of a woman, that lay scattered about upon the floor. Jane sat back on her heels and surveyed the melting folds of satin with an artist's eye. "'If you only knew what it means to me to get back with my baskets full of French beauties! Why, when I screwed up my courage two months ago to go to old Hildebrand and ask him to send me abroad as his buyer, I'd been studying drawing in French at nights for three years in preparation, you see. He roared like the dear old lion he is, and said I was too young. But I cooed and pleaded, and at last he said I could come, on trial, and so— He'll purr like a pussy-cat when you get back, Lady Crandall put in, with a pat on the brown head at her knees. Maybe, if I can slip into New York with my little baskets, while all the other buyers are still over here, cabling tearfully for money to get home, or asking their firms to send a warship to fetch them, why, I guess the pennant's mine all right." The eternal feminine, so strong in Iowa's transplanted stock, prompted a mischievous question. "'Then you won't be leaving somebody behind when you sail? Somebody who seems awfully nice and—' Foreigny and all that. All our American girls find the moonlight over on this side infectious. Witness me, a finishing trip abroad after school days, and see where I've finished, on a rock." Lady Crandall bubbled laughter. A shrewd downward sweep of her eye was just in time to catch a flush mounting to Jane's cheeks. "'Well, a mysterious stranger has crossed my path,' Jane admitted. He was very nice, but mysterious. Oh! A delighted gurgle from the older woman. Tell me all about it, a secret for these ancient walls to hear. Jane was about to reply, when second thought checked her tongue. Before her flashed that strange meeting with Captain Woodhouse the night before, his denial of their former meeting, followed by his curious insistence on her keeping faith with him by not revealing the fact of their acquaintance. She had promised, why she had promised she could no more divine than the reason for his asking, but a promise it was that she would not betray his confidence. More than once since that minute in the reception-room of the Hotel Splendide, 
Jane Gerson had reviewed the whole baffling circumstance in her mind, and a growing resentment at this stranger's demand, as well as at her own compliance with it, was rising in her heart. Still, this Captain Woodhouse was different, and, this Jane sensed without effort to analyze, the mystery which he threw about himself but served to set him apart from the common run of men. She evaded Lady Crandall's probing with a shrug of the shoulders. "'It's a secret which I myself do not know, Lady Crandall, and never will.' Back to the o'erweening lure of the gown, the flitting fancy of the general's lady betook itself. "'You don't think this is a shade too young for me, Miss Gerson?' Anxiety pleaded to be quashed. "'Nonsense!' Jane laughed. "'But I'm no chicken, my dear. If you would look me up in our family Bible back in Davenport, you'd find—' "'People don't believe everything they read in the Bible any more,' Jane assured her your record and jonah's would both be open to doubt you're very comforting lady crandall beamed her maid knocked and entered on the lady's crisp come the general wishes to see you lady crandall in the library tell the general i'm in the midst of trying on lady crandall began then thought better of her excuse she dropped the shimmering gown from her shoulders and slipped into a kimono some stuffy plan for entertaining somebody or other my dear this to jane the real burden of being governor-general of the rock falls on the general's wife just slip into your bonnet and when i'm back we'll take that little stroll through the alameda i've promised you for this morning she clutched her kimono about her and whisked out of the room general crandall just rid of the dubious pleasure of billy capper's company was pacing the floor of the library office thoughtfully. He looked up with a smile at his wife's entrance. "'Helen, I want you to do something for me,' he said. "'Certainly, dear.' Lady Crandall was not an unpleasing figure of ripe beauty to look on, in the soft drape of her Japanese robe. Even in his worry, General Crandall found himself intrigued for the minute. "'There's a new chap in the signal service, just in from Egypt, name's woodhouse i wish you would invite him to tea my dear of course any day this afternoon if you please helen the general followed his wife looked slightly puzzled this afternoon but george dear isn't that aren't you uh, rushing this young man to have him up to government house so soon after his arrival she suddenly remembered something that caused her to reverse herself Besides, I've asked him to dinner, the dinner I'm to give the Americans tomorrow night before they sail. General Crandall looked surprised. You didn't tell me that. I didn't know you had met him. Just happened to, Lady Crandall cut in hastily. Met him at the Hotel Splendide last night, when I brought Miss Gerson home with me. What was Woodhouse doing at the Splendide? the general asked suspiciously why spending the night you foolish boy just off the princess mary he was i believe he did miss gerson some sort of a service and i met him in that way quite informally did miss gerson a service hm oh a trifling thing it seems she had only french money and that cautious almer fellow wouldn't accept it captain woodhouse gave her english gold for it to pay her bill but why has Miss Gerson seen him since? General Crandall asked sharply. Why, George, dear, how could she? We haven't been up from the breakfast table an hour. Woodhouse was here less than an hour ago to pay his duty call and report, he explained. I thought perhaps he might have met our guest somewhere in the garden, as he was coming or going. He did send her some lovely roses, Lady Crandall brightened at this, to her patent inception of a romance. She doted on romances. They were in Miss Gerson's room before she was down to breakfast. Roses, eh? And they met informally at the Splendide only last night. Suspicion was weighing the general's words. Isn't that a bit sudden? I say, do you think Miss Gerson and this Captain Woodhouse had met somewhere before last night? I hardly think so. She's on her first trip to the continent, and he's coming from Egypt. But— no matter. 
I want him here to tea this afternoon. The general dismissed the subject and turned to his desk. His lady's curiosity would not be so lightly turned away. All these questions, aren't they rather absurd? Is anything wrong? She ran up to him and laid her hands on his shoulders. Of course not, dear. He kissed her lightly on the brow. Now run along and play with that new gown Miss Gerson gave you. I imagine that's the most important thing on the rock today. Lady Crandall gave her soldier husband a peck on each cheek, and slapped back to her room. When he was alone again, General Crandall resumed his restless pacing. Resolution suddenly crystallized, and he stepped to the desk telephone. He called a number. "'That you, Bishop? General Crandall speaking. Bishop, you were here on the rock seven years ago? Good. Pretty good memory for names and faces, eh? Right. I want you to come to Government House for tea at five this afternoon. But run over for a little talk with me some time earlier. An hour from now, say. Rather important. You'll be here. Thank you. General Crandall sat at his desk and tried to bring himself down to the routine crying from accumulated papers there. But the canker Billy Capper had implanted in his mind would not give him peace. Major General Crandall was a man cast in the stolid British mould. Years of army discipline and tradition of the service had given to his conservatism a hard grain. In common with most of those in high command, he held to the belief that nothing existed, nothing could exist, which was not down in the regulations of the war office, made and provided. For upward of twenty-five years he had played the hard game of the service, in Egypt, in Burma, on the broiling rocks of Aden, and here, at last, on the key to the Mediterranean. During all those years he had faithfully pursued his duty, had stowed away in his mind the wisdom disseminated in blue-bound books by that corporate paragon of knowledge at home, the War Office. But never had he read in anything but fluffy fiction of a place or a thing called the Wilhelmstrasse, reputed by the scriveners to be the darkest closet and the most potent of all the secret chambers of diplomacy. The regulations made no mention of a Wilhelmstrasse, even though they provided the brand of pipe-clay that should brighten men's pith helmets and stipulated to the ounce an emergency ration. Therefore, to the official military mind at least, the Wilhelmstrasse was non-existent. But here comes a beachcomber, a miserable jackal from the back alleys of society, and warns the Governor-General of the Rock that he has a man from the Wilhelmstrasse a spy bent on some unfathomable mission, in his very forces on the rock. He says that an agent of the enemy has dared masquerade as a British officer in order to gain admission inside the lines of Europe's most impregnable fortress, England's precious stronghold, there to do mischief. General Crandall's tremendous responsibility would not permit him to ignore such a warning, coming even from so low a source yet the man found himself groping blindly in the dark before the dilemma presented. He had no foot-rule of precept or experience to guide him. His fruitless searching for a prop in emergency was broken by the appearance of Jane Gerson in the door opening from Lady Crandall's rooms to the right of the library. The girl was dressed for the out-of-doors. In her arms was a fragrant bunch of blood-red roses spraying out from the top of a bronze bowl. The girl hesitated, and drew back in confusion at seeing the room occupied. She seemed eager to escape undetected, but General Crandall smilingly checked her flight. "'I... I thought you would be out,' Jane stammered, and... "'And the posies,' the General interrupted, "'were for you to enjoy when you should come back.' She smiled easily into the man's eyes. "'They'll look so much prettier here than in my room.' "'Very good of you, I'm sure,' General Crandall stepped up to the rich cluster of buds and sniffed critically. Without looking at the girl, he continued, "'It appears to me as though you had already made a conquest on the rock. One doesn't pick these from the cliffs, you know.' "'I should hardly call it a conquest,' Jane answered, with a sprightly toss of her head. "'But a young man sent you these flowers. Come, confess!' 
the general's tone was bantering but his eyes did not leave the piquant face under the chic summer straw hat that shaded it surely one of your own men captain woodhouse of the signal service jane was rearranging the stems in the bowl apparently ready to accept what was on the surface of the general's rallying woodhouse eh you've known him for a long time i take it since last night general and yet some people say englishmen are slow she laughed gaily and turned to face him his voice took on a subtle quality of polite insistence surely you met him somewhere before gibraltar how could i when this is the first time captain woodhouse has been out of egypt for years who told you that the general was quick to catch her up the girl felt a swift stab of fear on the instant she realized that here was somebody attempting to drive into the mystery which she herself could not understand but which she had pledged herself to keep inviolate her voice fluttered in her throat as she answered why he did himself general he did eh gave you a bit of his history on first meeting confiding chap what but you miss gerson you've been to egypt you say no general jane was beginning to find this cross-examination distinctly painful she felt that already her pledge so glibly given at captain woodhouse's insistence was involving her in a situation the significance of which might prove menacing to herself and one other she could sense the beginnings of a strain between herself and this genial elderly gentleman her host do you know miss gerson he was speaking soberly now i believe you and captain woodhouse have met before you're at liberty to think anything you like general the truth or otherwise her answer though given smilingly had a sting behind it i'm not going to think much longer i'm going to know he clapped his lips shut over the last word with a smack of authority are you really general crandall the girl's eyes hardened just perceptibly he took a turn of the room and paused facing her the situation pleased him no more than it did his breezy guest, but he knew his duty and doggedly pursued it. "'Come, come, Miss Gerson. I believe you're straightforward and sincere, or I wouldn't be wasting my time this way. I'll be the same with you. This is a time of war. You understand all that implies, I hope. A serious question concerning Captain Woodhouse's position here has arisen. If you have met him before, as I think you have, it will be to your advantage to tell me where and when. I am in command of the rock, you know." He finished with an odd tenseness of tone that conveyed assurance of his authority even more than did the sense of his words. His guest, her back to the table on which the roses rested, and her hands, bracing her by their tense grip on the table edge, sought his eyes boldly. "'General Crandall,' she began my training in hildebrand's store hasn't made me much of a diplomat all this war and intrigue makes me dizzy but i know one thing this isn't my war or my country's and i'm going to follow my country's example and keep out of it general crandall shrugged his shoulders and smiled at the girl's defiance maybe your country may not be able to do that he declared with a touch of solemnity i pray god it may but I'm afraid your resolution will not hold, Miss Gerson. I'm going to try to make it anyway, she answered. Gibraltar's commander, baffled thus by a neutral, a neutral fair to look on, in the bargain, tried another tack. He assumed the fatherly air. Lady Crandall and I have tried to show you we were friends, tried to help you get home, he began. You've been very good to me, Jane broke in feelingly what i say now is spoken as a friend not as governor of the rock if it is true that you have met woodhouse before and our conversation here verifies my suspicion that very fact makes his word worthless and releases you from any promise you may have made not to reveal this and what you may know about him also it should put you on your guard his motives in any attentions he may pay you cannot be above suspicion i think that is a personal matter i am perfectly capable of handling jane's resentment sent the flags to her cheeks general crandall was quick to backwater 
Yes, yes, don't misunderstand me. What I mean to say is... He was interrupted by his wife's voice calling for Jane from the nearby room. Anticipating her interruption, he hurried on. For the present, Miss Gerson, we'll drop this matter. I said a few minutes ago I intended shortly to... No. I hope I won't have to carry out that... threat. Jane was withdrawing one of the buds from the jar. At his last word, she dropped it with a little gasp. Threat, General? I hope not. Truly, I hope not. But, young woman... She stooped, picked up the flower, and was setting it in his buttonhole before he could remonstrate. This one was for you, General, she said, and the truce was sealed. That minute Lady Crandall was wafted into the room on the breeze of her own staccato interruption. What's this? What's this? Flirting with poor old George, pinning a rose on my revered husband when my back's turned. Brazen, miss! I'm here to take you off to the gardens at once, where you can find somebody younger, and not near so dear, to captivate with your tricks. At once now! She had her arm through Jane's, and was marching her off. An exchange of glances between the governor and Hildebrand's young diplomat of the dollar said that what had passed between them was a confidence. Jameer Khan announced Major Bishop to the general a short time later. The major, a rotund, pink-faced man of forty, who had the appearance of being ever tubbed and groomed to the pink of parade perfection, saluted his superior informally, accepted a cigarette, and crossed his plump legs in an easy chair near the general's desk. General Crandall folded his arms on his desk and went direct to his subject. "'Major, you were here on the rock seven years ago, you say?' "'Here ten years, General. Regular rock scorpion. Old timer. Do you happen to recall this chap Woodhouse, whom I sent to you to report for duty in the signal tower today? Has transfer papers from Vadi Halfa. Haven't met him yet, though Captain Carson tells me he reported at my office a little more than an hour ago. See him after parade. Woodhouse. Woodhouse. The major propped his chin on his fingers in thought. His papers, army record and all that, say he was here on the rock for three months in the spring of 1907, General Crandall urged, to refresh the other's memory. Major Bishop stroked his round cheeks, tugged at one ear, but found recollection difficult. "'When I see the chap, so many coming and going, you know, three months, bless me, that's a thin slice out of ten years.' "'Major, I'm going to take you into my confidence,' the senior officer began. Then he related the incident of Capper's visit, and repeated the charge he had made. Bishop sat aghast at the word spy. "'Woodhouse will be here to tea this afternoon,' continued Crandall. "'While you and I ask him a few leading questions, I'll have Jameer, my Indian, search his room in barracks. I trust Jameer implicitly, and he can do the job smoothly. Now, Bishop, what do you remember about 1907? Something we can lead up to in conversation, you know?' The younger man knuckled his brow for a minute, then looked up brightly. "'I say, General, Cragen was governor then, but, uh, aren't you a bit mild, this asking of a suspected spy to tea?' "'What can I do?' the other replied, somewhat testily. "'I can't clap an officer of His Majesty's army into prison on the mere say-so of a drunken outcast who has no proof to offer. I must go slowly, Major. Watch for a slip from this woodhouse.' One bad move on his part, and he starts on his way to face a firing squad. Bishop had risen, and was slowly pacing the room, his eyes on the walls, hung with many portraits in oils. "'Well, you can't help admiring the nerve of the chap,' he muttered, half to himself. Forcing his way on to the rock, why, he might as well put his head in a cannon's mouth. "'I haven't time to admire,' the general said shortly thing to do is to act. Quite right. Nineteen seven, eh? Hmm. He paused before the portrait of a young woman in a Gainsborough hat, and with a sparkling, piquant face. By George, General, why not try him on Lady Evelyn? There's a fair test for you now. You mean Cragen's wife? 
The general looked up at the portrait quizzically. Skeleton's bones, Bishop. Right, but no man who ever saw her could forget. I know I never can. Poor Cragen. Good idea, though, the older man acquiesced. We'll trip him on Lady Evelyn. Jamir Khan appeared at the double doors. The General Sahib's orderly, he announced. The young subaltern entered and saluted. That young man, General Crandall, the one Sergeant Crosby was to escort out of the lines to Algeciras. Well, what of him? He's gone, I hope. First train to Madrid, General. But he left a message for you, sir, to be delivered after he'd gone, he said. A message? General Crandall was perplexed. As Sergeant Crosby had it and gave it to me to repeat to you, sir, it was... Arrest the cigar girl, calling herself Josepha. She is one of the cleverest spies of the Wilhelmstrasse. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Enter a cigarette. Mr. Joseph Almer, proprietor of the Hotel Splendide, on Waterport Street, was absorbed, heart and soul, in a curious task. He was emptying the powder from two grain quinine capsules on to a sheet of white letter paper on his desk. It was noon of Wednesday, the day following the arrival of Captain Woodhouse. Almer was alone in the hotel's reception room and office, behind the dingy glass partially enclosing his desk. His alpaca-covered shoulders were close to his ears, and his bald head, with its stripes of plastered hair running like thick lines of latitude on a polished globe, was held far forward so as to bring his eyes on the work in hand. Like some plump magpie he appeared, turning over bits of china in a treasure-hole. A round box of the gelatin cocoons lay at his left hand. It had just been delivered by an Arab boy, quick to pick up the street commission for a tuppence. Very methodically, Almer picked the capsules from the box one by one, opened them, and spilled the quinine in a little heap under his nose. He grunted peevishly when the sixth shell had been emptied. The seventh capsule brought an eager whistle to his lips. When he had jerked the concentric halves apart, very little powder fell out. Instead, the thin, folded edges of a pellet of rice paper protruded from one of the containers. This Almer had extracted in an instant. He spread it against the black back of a ledger, and read the very fine script written thereon. This was the message. Danger. An informer from Alexandria has denounced our two friends to Crandall. You must warn. I cannot. The spy's heart was suddenly drained, and the wisp of paper in his hand trembled so that it scattered the quinine about in a thin cloud. Once more he read the note, then held a match to it, and scuffed its feathery ash with his feet into the rug beneath his stool. The fortitude which had held Joseph Almer to the rock, in the never-failing hope that some day would bring him the opportunity to do a great service for the fatherland, came near crumbling that minute. He groaned. "'Our friends,' he whispered, "'Woodhouse and Louisa, trapped!' The warning in the note left nothing open to ambiguity for Almer. There were but four of them, friends, under the Wilhelmstrasse Fellowship of Danger, there in Gibraltar. Louisa, the man who passed as Woodhouse, and whose hand was to execute the great coup when the right moment came, himself, and that other one whose place was in Government House itself. From this latter the note of warning had come. How desperate the necessity for it Almer could guess when he took into reckoning the dangers that beset any attempt at communication on the writer's part. So narrow the margin of safety for this friend, that he must look at each setting sun as being reasonably the last for him. Almer did not attempt to go behind the note and guess who was the informer that had lodged information with the Governor-General. He had forgotten, in fact, the incident of the night before, when the blustering capper called the newly arrived Woodhouse by name. 
the flash of suspicion that attached responsibility to the american girl named gerson was dissipated as quickly as it came she had arrived by motor from paris not on the boat from alexandria his was now the imperative duty to carry warning to the two suspected not to waste time in idle speculation as to the identity of the betrayer there was but one ray of hope in this sudden pall of gloom and that almer grasped eagerly he knew the character of general crandall the phlegmatic conservatism of the man who would not easily be jarred out of an accustomed line of thought and action the general would be slow to leap at an accusation brought against one wearing the stripes of service and though he might reasonably attempt to test captain woodhouse one such as Woodhouse, chosen by the Wilhelmstrasse to accomplish so great a mission, would surely have the wit to parry suspicion. Yes, he must be put on his guard. As for Louisa, well, it would be too bad if the girl should have to put her back against a wall. But she could be spared. She was not essential. After he had succeeded in getting word of his danger to Woodhouse, Almer would consider saving Louisa from a firing squad the nimble mind of herr almer shook itself free from the incubus of dread and leaped to the exigency of the moment calling his head waiter to keep warm the chair behind the desk almer retired to his room and there was exceedingly busy for half an hour the hour of parade during wartime on gibraltar was one o'clock at that time six days a week the half of the garrison not actually in fighting position behind the great guns of the defence marched to the parade grounds down by the race-track and there went through the grilling regimen that meant perfection and the maintenance of a hair-trigger state of efficiency down from the rocky eminences where the barracks stood marched this day block after block of olive drab fighting units artillerymen for the most part equipped with the rifle and pack of infantrymen no blare of brass music gave the measure to their step bandsmen in this time of reality paced two by two stretchers carried between them all the curl and snap of silken banners that made the parade a moving spectacle in ordinary times was absent flags do not figure in the grim modern business of warfare just those solid blocks of men trained to kill sweeping down on to the level grounds and massing rank on rank for inspection and the trip-hammer pound 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 of evolutions to follow silent integers of power flexing their muscles for the supreme test that any morning sun might bring mr henry j sherman stood with his wife kitty and willie kimball kimball had developed a surprising interest in one of these home folks at least under the shade of the row of plane trees fringing the parade grounds they tried to persuade themselves that they were seeing something worth while this pleasing fiction wore thin with mr sherman before fifteen minutes had passed shucks mother the boys at the national guard encampment down to galesburg fair last year made a better showing than this he pursed out his lips and regarded a passing battalion with a critical eye looked more like soldiers anyway mother admitted those floppy broad-brimmed hats our boys wear make them look more more romantic i'd say but my dear mrs sherman willie kimball flicked his handkerchief from his cuff and fluttered it across his coat sleeve where dust had fallen the guards back in the states are play soldiers you know these chaps here well they are the real thing they don't dress up like picture-book soldiers and show off play soldiers ha huh. henry j had fire in his eye and the pearl buttons on his white linen waistcoat creaked with the swelling of a patriot's pride you've been a long time from home willie perhaps you've forgotten that your own father was at corinth guess you've overlooked that soldier's monument in courthouse square back in little old kiwani they were play soldiers eh those boys who marched away with your dad in sixty one gimme a regiment of those old boys in blue and they could lick this whole bunch of father kitty had flipped her hand over her parent's mouth her eyes round with real fear you'll get arrested again talking that way where everybody can hear you remember what that hotel man said last night about careless remarks about military things on the rock be good father there there 
Sherman removed the monetary hand and patted it reassuringly. I forgot. But when I get aboard the Saxonia and well out to sea, I'm going to just bust information about what I think of things in general over here in this Europe place, their body celly pictures and their broken-down churches and, and, why, bless my soul, the little store buyer and that Iowa girl who's married to the governor here. The patriot stopped short in his review of the continent's delinquencies to wave his hat at Lady Crandall and Jane Gerson, who were trundling down under the avenue of planes in a small dog-cart. Lady Crandall answered his hail with a flourish of her whip, turned her horse off the road, and brought her conveyance to a stop by the group of exiles. Hearty greetings passed around. The governor's wife showed her unaffected pleasure at the meeting. "'I thought you wouldn't miss the parade,' she called down from her high seat. "'Only thing that moves on the rock, these daily reviews. Brought Miss Gerson down here, so when she gets back to New York she can say she's seen the defenders of Gibraltar, if not in action, at least doing their hard training for it.' "'Well, I don't mind telling you,' Sherman began defiantly. I think the National Guard of Illinois can run circles around these Englishmen when it comes to putting up a show. Now, Kitty, don't you try to drive a plug in your dad's sentiments again. Mrs. Crandall's all right, one of us. A shocked look from his daughter. Oh, there I go again, forgettin'. Lady Crandall, I mean. Excuse me, ma'am. Don't you dare apologize, the governor's wife playfully threatened Mr. Sherman with her whip. I love the sound of good old-fashioned Mrs. Just imagine, married five years, and nobody has called me Mrs. Crandall until you did just now. Wedded, but not a Mrs. Wouldn't that be a perfectly gorgeous title for a Laura Jean novel? Miss Gerson, let's hop out and join these home folks. They're my kind. The burst of laughter that greeted Lady Crandall's sally was not over before she had leaped nimbly from her high perch, Henry J. gallantly assisting. Jane followed, and the coachman from his little bob seat in the back drove the dog-cart over the road to wait his mistress's pleasure. The scattered blocks of olive grey on the field had coalesced into a solid regiment now, and the long double rank of men was sweeping forward like the cutting arm of a giant mower. The party of Americans joined the sparse crowd of spectators at the edge of the field, the better to see. Jane Gerson found herself chatting with Willie Kimball and Kitty Sherman a little apart from the others. A light touch fell on her elbow. She turned to find Almer, the hotel-keeper, smiling deferentially. "'Pardon, a thousand pardons for the intrusion, lady. I am Almer, of the Hotel Splendide. "'You haven't remembered something more I owe you,' Jane challenged brusquely. "'Oh, no, lady,' Almer spread out his hands. "'I happened to see you here watching the parade, and I remembered a trivial duty I have which, if I may be so bold as to ask, you may discharge much more quickly than I, if you will.' "'I discharge a duty? For you?' The girl did not conceal her puzzlement. Almer's hand fumbled in a pocket of his flapping alpaca coat, and produced a plain silver cigarette case, unmonogrammed. She looked at it wonderingly. "'Captain Woodhouse, you met him at my hotel last night, lady. He left this lying on his dresser when he quit his room to go to barracks to-day. For me it is difficult to send a messenger with it to the barracks. Wartime, lady. Many restrictions inside the lines.' I came here hoping perhaps to see the captain after the parade, but you—' "'You wish me to give this to Captain Woodhouse?' Jane finished, a flicker of annoyance crossing her face. "'Why me?' "'You are at Government House, lady. Captain Woodhouse comes to tea. All newcomers to the garrison do that. If you would be so good—' Jane took the cigarette case from Alma's outstretched hand. Lady Crandall had told her the captain would be in for tea that afternoon. It was a small matter, this accommodation, as long as Almer did not insinuate, as he had not done, any impertinence, imply any over-eagerness on her part to perform so minor a service for the officer. Almer bowed his thanks and lost himself in the crowd. Jane turned again to where Kitty and Kimball were chatting. 
a dun for extra service the landlord forgot last night i'll wager the youth greeted her oh no just a little present jane laughed back at him holding up the silver case with alma's compliments to captain woodhouse who forgot it when he gave up his room to-day i've promised to turn it over to the captain and save the hotel man a lot of trouble and red tape getting a messenger through to the captain's quarters by jove kimball's tired eyes lighted up with a quick flash of smoker's yearning a life-saver came away from my room without my pet egyptians mr sherman yelling at me to hurry or we'd miss this slow show and all that i'm going to play the panhandler and beg one of your captain friends smokes he must be a good sort or you wouldn't be doing little favors for him miss gerson come now in your capacity as temporary executrix will you invest one of the captain's cigarettes in a demand of real charity keen desire was scarcely veiled under kimball's fiction of light patter smilingly the girl extended the case to him just to make it businesslike the executrix demands your note for um sixty days say for one cigarette received i promise to pay given he pulled a gold pencil from his pocket and made a pretense of writing the form on his cuff then he lit his borrowed cigarette and inhaled it gratefully your captain friends straight from egypt i don't have to be told that willie kimball murmured in polite ecstasy at shepherd's in cairo you'll get such a cigarette as this and nowhere else in a barren world the breath of the acanthus blossom if it really has a breath never heard back in kiwani the ladies aid society will have you arrested kitty put in mischievously they're terribly wrought up over cigarettes for minors kimball cast her a glance of deep reproach as he lifted the cigarette to his lips for a second puff jane's eyes mechanically followed the movement something caught and held them wonder filled on the side of the white paper cylinder nearest her a curious brown streak appeared by the merest freak of chance her glance fell on it as she looked the thin stain grew darker nearest the fresh ash the farther end of the faint tracing moved yes moved like a thread-worm groping its way along a stick now what are they all doing out there kitty sherman was asking all those men running top speed with their guns carried up so high bayonet charge kimball answered nothing like the real thing of course jane gerson was watching the twisting and writhing of that filament of brown against the white an invisible hand was writing in brown ink on the side of the cigarette writing backward and away from the burning tip it lengthened by seconds and louisa to crandall so the letters of silver nitrate formed themselves under her eyes kimball took the cigarette from his lips and held it by his side for a minute he and kitty were busy with each other's company for the time ignoring jane she burned with curiosity and with excitement mounting like the fire of wine to her brain would he never put that cigarette to his lips again so she could follow the invisible pen so fleeting so evanescent that worm track on the paper wrought by fire and by fire to be consumed a mystery vanishing even as it was a borning after ages the unconscious kimball set the cigarette again in his lips former has denounced you and louisa t play your game and he will be slow to again the cigarette came away in kimball's hand acting on impulse she did not stop to question jane struck it from the young man's outstretched hand and set her foot on it as it fell in the dust oh i'm clumsy she fell lightly against kimball's shoulder and caught herself in well-simulated confusion standing tiptoe to see what that man on a horse is going to do lost my balance and and your precious cigarette gone the anguish in jane gerson's voice was not play it was real terribly real end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of inside the lines by earl biggers and robert ritchie this librivox recording is in the public domain the captain comes to tea 
Jane Gerson, alone for the first time since the incident of the cigarette on the parade ground a few hours back, sat before a narrow window in her room at Government House, fighting a great bewilderment. The window opened on a varied prospect of blooming gardens and sail-flecked bay beyond but for her eyes the riot of colour and clash of contrast between bald cliff and massed green had no appeal. Her hands locked and unlocked themselves on her lap. The girl's mind struggled to coordinate scattered circumstances into a comprehensive whole, to grapple with the ethical problem of her own conduct. What she knew, or thought she knew, and what she should do, those were the two sabre points of the dilemma upon which she found herself impaled. Could there now be any doubt of what she felt to be the truth? First, she had met Captain Woodhouse on the Express du Nord, an officer in the English army, by his own statement, returning from leave in England to his post in Egypt. Then the encounter of last night at the Hotel Splendide, Captain Woodhouse first denying his identity, then admitting it under the enforced pledge that she should not reveal the former meeting. Captain Woodhouse, not in Egypt, but at Gibraltar, and, as she had soon learned, there with papers of transfer, from an Egyptian post to the garrison of the Rock. Following this surprise had come General Crandall's dogged examination of that morning, his blunt declaration that a serious question as to the captain's position at Gibraltar had arisen, and his equally plain-spoken threat to have the truth from her concerning her knowledge of the suspected officer. To cap all, the message on the cigarette. An informer, she guessed the prefix to the unfinished word, had denounced you and Louisa to General Crandall. To whom the pronoun referred was unmistakable. Almer's eagerness to ensure Captain Woodhouse's receiving the cigarette case plainly defined that. As to Louisa, involved with Woodhouse, the girl from Hildebrand's was sensible only of a passing flash of curiosity, made a bit more piquant, perhaps, by a little dart of jealousy, hardly comprehended as such. A hotel-keeper warns an officer in the Gibraltar garrison that he has been denounced, but in the same message adjures him to play your own game. That was the single compelling fact. Jane Gerson flushed, in anger, or was it through guilt, when she found her lips framing the word spy? Now she understood why General Crandall had put her on the grill, why he, informed, had leaped to the significance of the gift of roses, and deduced her previous acquaintance with their donor. Her host was not, after all, the possessor of magical powers of mind-reading. He was, instead, just the sober, conscientious protector of the rock on whom rested responsibility for the lives of its defenders and the maintenance of England's flag there. His duty was to catch, and shoot, spies. Shoot spies! The girl's heart contracted at the thought no no she would not she could not reveal to the governor the knowledge she had that would be to send death to a man as surely as if hers was the finger at the trigger jane gerson was on her feet now pacing the room over and over again she told herself that this man who had come into her life obliquely enough had no claim on her had brought nothing to her but distress he had deceived her even, and then, when caught in the deception, had wrested from her a promise that she would help him continue further deception against others. Against her will he had made her a party to some deep and audacious plot, whose purpose she could not guess, but which must be a part of the huge mystery of war. And soon this Captain Woodhouse was to come to his trial. The purpose of his invitation to tea that afternoon flashed clear as white light. Soon she would be in the same room with him, would be forced to witness the spinning of the web set to trap him. He would come unwarned, unsuspecting. He might leave that room under guard and with guns at his back, guns soon to be levelled at his heart. Yet she, Jane Gerson, possessed the power to save him, as the warning of the cigarette surely would be saving once a clever man were put on his guard by it. Would she speak, and betray General Crandall, her kindly host? Would she lock her lips, and see a man walk blindfolded to his death? 
a few minutes before five o'clock major bishop was announced at government house and received by general crandall in the library before jamir khan who had preceded the visitor through the double doors from the hall could retire his master stopped him one minute jamir have a seat bishop glad you've come a bit early come here jamir the tall reed-like figure of the indian glided to general crandall's side his thin ascetic features were set in their usual mode of unseeing detachment only his dark eyes showed animation yes my general he said as he stopped before the englishman i have a little commission for you jamir general crandall began weighing his words with care the utmost discretion you understand the utmost i understand Jamir Khan's lips moved ever so slightly, and his eyes looked steadily ahead. "'In the course of a few minutes Captain Woodhouse, of the signal service, will be here to tea,' the general began. The Indian repeated mechanically, "'Captain Woodhouse. As soon as you have ushered him into this room, you will go as quickly as you can to the West Barracks. His room will be number 36, on the second gallery.' you will enter his room with a key i shall give you and search it from end to end everything in it anything that is of a suspicious nature you understand jamir what that might be you will bring here to me at once it shall be done general sahib no one officer or man must suspect your errand no one must see you enter or leave that room no one the indian repeated general crandall went to a wall safe set by the side of the double doors turned the combination and opened it he took from a drawer therein a bunch of keys selected one and passed it to jamir khan the utmost care remember he warned again is it likely i should fail you this time general sahib when so many times i have succeeded make the search complete general crandall ignored his servant's question but return as quickly as you can. I shall keep Captain Woodhouse here until you do so. You must report to me before he leaves this house. When the moment arrives, your servant shall fly, General Sahib, the Indian replied, and withdrew. I say, General, you have a great deal of faith in your Indian, Bishop ventured, accepting a cigarette from his superior's case. Rather a delicate commission you've given him. Absolute faith, yes been with me five years picked him up in rangoon have tried him many times and found him loyal as any officer in the service general crandall put in his words enough emphasis to carry slight rebuke for the other's implied criticism but the percy little major was too sure of the fine terms of personal friendship between himself and his superior to feel embarrassment about that girl general that cigar girl josepha concerning whom your beachcomber friend sent that warning this morning from the safe ground of spain obvious thing would have been to clap her in a cell the governor answered but i have not for the very good reason that if there's anything in this fellow's accusations against her as well as against woodhouse the game will be to keep her watched and give our captain an opportunity to communicate with her minute he does that why we've got our proof against both then I take it you've put a trailer on the girl? At eight o'clock tonight I'll know where she's been every hour of the day, the general returned confidently. She can't leave the town without being arrested. Now, as to our plan for Woodhouse's reception, this affair of Cragen's wife, we might as well agree on points so that— He heard his wife's voice in the room off the library, and broke off abruptly. Confound it, the women are coming! just step into my room with me and we'll go over this little matter major general crandall held open a small door at the left of his desk and followed bishop through lady crandall and jane entered the library almost at the same time this tea of george's is preposterous the lady of government house was grumbling said we must have this man from egypt here at once if you were english no tea could be preposterous jane countered with a brave attempt at lightness she felt each passing moment a weight adding to the suspense of the inevitable event well i'm going to get it through with just as soon as i can lady crandall snapped 
Then Jamir Khan threw open the double doors and announced, "'Captain Woodhouse, my lady!' "'Show him up,' she commanded. Then, in complaint to Jane, "'Now where do you suppose that husband of mine went? Just like him to suggest a tea and forget to make an appearance!' Captain Woodhouse appeared between the open doors in khaki and trim puttees. He stood very straight for an instant, his eyes shooting rapidly about the room. Lady Crandall hurried forward to greet him, and his momentary stiffness disappeared. The girl behind her followed slowly, almost reluctantly. Woodhouse grasped her extended hand. "'It was good of you to send the flowers,' she murmured. The man smiled appreciation. "'Do you know,' he said, "'after I sent them I thought you'd consider me a bit prompt.' "'I am learning something every day about Englishmen,' Jane managed to answer, with a ghost of a smile. "'Always something good, I hope,' Woodhouse was quick to retort, his eyes eagerly trying to fathom the cause of the girl's restraint. Lady Crandall, who had been vainly ringing for Jamir Khan, excused herself on the necessity of looking after the tea-things. Jane experienced a quick stab of dread at finding herself alone with this man. Unexpected opportunity was urging a decision which an hour of solitude in her room had failed to bring. Yet she trembled, appalled and afraid to speak, before the very magnitude of the moment's exigency. "'A spy! A spy!' whispered austere duty. "'He will die!' her heart cried in protest. "'Miss Gerson, it's good to see you again and know by your hand-clasp you have forgiven me for—for for what was very necessary at the moment, last night, our meeting in the Splendide. Captain Woodhouse was standing before her now, his grave eyes looking down into hers. The girl caught a deep note of sincerity and something else, something vibrantly personal yet her tongue would not be loosed of its burden. "'A very pretty speech,' she answered with attempted raillery. "'I shall think of it on the boat going home.' "'I say, I wish you weren't always in that horrid state of mind, on your way home mentally,' Captain Woodhouse challenged. "'I shall be so in reality day after to-morrow, I hope,' she replied. "'Away from all this bewildering war, and back in comfortable little New York.' The man seemed genuinely grieved at her announcement. "'New York must be worth while, but I imagine you have nothing picturesque, nothing old there. I'll wager you haven't a single converted monastery like Government House in all your city.' "'Not many things in New York have been converted,' she answered with a smile. "'Our greatest need is for a municipal evangelist.' false all false this banter she knew it to be and so she believed he must read it and the man his ease of manner was either that of innocence or of supreme nerve the second not less to be admired than the first could it be that behind his serious eyes now frankly telling her what she dared not let herself read in them lay duplicity and a spy's cunning i fancy you new yorkers suffer most from newness newness right out of the shop she heard him saying but the old things are the best imagine the monks of a long ago yesterday toasting themselves before this ancient fireplace he waved toward the massive gothic mantel bridging a cavernous fireplace an old chime bell green with weathering hung on a low frame beside the fire dogs you're mistaken that's manufactured antiquity jane caught him up Lady Crandall told me last night that fireplace is just five years old, one of the preceding governor's hobbies it was. Woodhouse caught at her answer with a quick lifting of the brows. He turned again to feast his eyes on the girl's piquant face, even more alluring now because of the fleeting colour that left the cheeks with a tea-rose's coldness. "'Miss Gerson, something I have done or said,' the man was labouring afterwards, "'you are not yourself.' and maybe I am respon— She turned from him with a slight shudder. Her hand was extended in mute appeal for silence. He waited while his eyes followed the heaving of her shoulders under the emotion that was racking her. Suddenly she faced him again, and words rushed from her lips in an abandon of terror. "'Captain Woodhouse, I know too much about you and why you are here. 
oh more than i want to accident bad luck believe me it is not my seeking that i know you are a a he had started forward at her outburst and now he stood very close to her his grey eyes cold and unchanging say it say the word i'm not afraid to hear it he commanded tensely she drew back from him a little wildly her hands fluttering up as if to fend him off you you are in great danger this minute you were brought here this afternoon to be trapped exposed and made i was fully aware of that when i came miss gerson he interrupted the invitation coming so suddenly so pressing i think i read it aright but the promise you made me give last night sudden resentment brushed aside for the instant the girl's first flood of sympathy that has involved me with you oh that was unfair to make me promise i would not allude to to our first meeting involved you he closed one of her hands in his as if to calm her and force more rational speech then you have been questioned by general crandall about you she broke in struggling slightly to free her hand questioned and even bullied and threatened and you kept your promise the question was put so low jane could hardly catch it she slowly nodded miss gerson you will never have cause to regret that you did woodhouse pressed her hand with almost fierce intenseness then let it go her face was flaming now under the stress of excitement she knew tears stood in her eyes and was angered at their being there he might mistake them. Woodhouse continued, in the same suppressed tone, "'You were on the point of using a word a minute ago, Miss Gerson, which was hard for you to voice because you thought it an ugly word. You seemed sure it was the right word to fit me. You only hesitated out of, uh, decency. Yet you kept faith with me before General Crandall. May I hope that means—' "'You may hope nothing.' quick rebellion at what she divined to be coming flamed in jane's eyes you have no right to hope for more from me than what you forced by promise i would not be saying what i have to you if if i did not feel i that your life you misunderstood he broke in stiffly i was on the point of saying i hope you would not always believe me a not believe her hand went to the broad ribbon belt she wore and brought out the silver cigarette case this she passed to him with a swift gesture. Almer, the Hotel Splendide man, gave me this to-day at parade, urging that I deliver it to you. She was speaking hurriedly. By a miracle, the strangest circumstance in the world, I learned the message this cigarette case was to carry to you. Oh, no, innocently enough on my part, it came by a chance I must not take the time to explain. A message from Almer to me? Woodhouse could not conceal the start her words gave him. He took a step toward her eagerly. "'Yes, a message. You must have it to protect yourself. The message was this. Informer has denounced you and Louisa to—' Her voice died in her throat. Over Captain Woodhouse's shoulder she saw a door open. General Crandall and a short fat man in officer's uniform entered the library. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Inside the Lines » by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Third Degree "'Good afternoon, Captain Woodhouse.' General Crandall came forward and shook the captain's hand cordially. Miss Gerson, Major Bishop, of my staff. Jane acknowledged the introduction. Major Bishop advanced to the meeting with Woodhouse expectantly. With an air of ill-assumed ease, the Governor made them known to each other. Major Bishop, your new man in the signal tower, Captain Woodhouse, from Body Halfa. Captain, do you happen to remember the Major? Was a captain when you were here on the rock, captain in the engineers. I am afraid we never met," Woodhouse began easily. I was here such a short time, expected to meet Major Bishop when I reported at his office this morning, but he was over at the wireless station, his aide told me. Right, Captain. 
Bishop chirped, shaking his subordinate's hand. I uh, imagine this is the first time we've met. He put the least shade of emphasis on the verb. Woodhouse met his eyes boldly. Lady Crandall, bustling in at this minute, directed a maid where to wheel the tea-wagon, while Jane went to assist her with the pouring. The men soon had their cups, and the general and major contrived to group themselves with Woodhouse, sitting between them. Sir George, affecting a gruff geniality, launched a question. "'Rock look familiar to you, Captain?' "'After a fashion, yes,' Woodhouse answered slowly though three months is so short a time for one to get a lasting impression. Nonsense, the general reproved gustily. Some places you see once, you never forget. This old rock is one of them, eh, Bishop? I don't know, the chunky little officer replied. The powers back home never give me a chance to get away and forget. There was a pause as the men sipped their tea. Woodhouse broke the silence. Man can be stationed in worse places than Gibraltar. If you mean Egypt, I agree with you, Crandall assented. There, six years. Were you, General? What station? Woodhouse was coolly stirring his tea, emphatically at his ease. Jane, her back to the men as she fussed over the tea-wagon, filled her own cup with hot water inadvertently. She tried to laugh over the mistake, but her fingers trembled as she poured the water back into the kettle. "'Not on the lazy old Nile, as you were, lucky dog,' the general returned. "'Out on the yellow sands, at Arkavon. A place in the sun, never fear.' The women had their cups now, and joined the men, sitting a little behind. Jane caught a shrewd sidewise glance from the general, a glance that sought a quick and sure reading of her emotions. She poised her cup as if expecting a question, and the glance turned aside but it had warned the girl that she was not altogether a passive factor in the situation. She set a guard over her features. "'Let me see, Captain Woodhouse. It was little Bishop who took up the probe. You must have been here in the days when Cragen was governor, saw your papers have it that you were here three months in nineteen seven. "'Yes, Cragen was governor then,' Woodhouse answered guardedly. "'You never saw him, General?' Bishop turned to Sir George. Big, bluff, blustering chap, with a voice like a bull of Bashan. Woodhouse here, he'll recognize my portrait. Woodhouse smiled. Secret disdain for the clumsy trap was in that smile. I'm afraid I do not, he said. Cragen was considered a small, almost a delicate man. He had recognized the bungling emphasis laid by Bishop on the Cragen characteristics, and his answer was pretty safely drawn by choosing the opposites. Bishop looked flustered for an instant, then admitted Woodhouse was right. He had confused Sir David Cragen with his predecessor, he said in excuse. I fancy I ought to remember the man. I had tea in this very room with him several times, Woodhouse ventured. He let his eyes rove as if in reminiscence. Much the same here, as— except, General Crandall, I don't recall that fireplace. He indicated the heavy Gothic ornament on the opposite side of the room. Jane caught her breath under the surge of secret elation. The resource of the man so to turn to advantage a fact that she had carelessly given him in their conversation a few moments back. The girl saw a flicker of surprise cross General Crandall's face. Lady Crandall broke in. You have a good memory after all, Captain Woodhouse. That fireplace is just five years old. Um, yes, yes, her husband admitted. Clever piece of work, though. Likely to deceive anybody by its show of antiquity. General Crandall called for a second slice of lemon in his cup. He was obviously sparring for another opening, but was impressed by the showing the suspected man was making. Bishop pushed the Inquisition another step. Did you happen to be present, Captain, at the farewell dinner we gave little Billy Barnes? I think it must have been in the spring you were here. There were many dinners, Major Bishop. Woodhouse was carefully selecting his words, and he broke his sentences with a sip from his cup. Seven years is a long time, you know. We had much else to think about in Egypt than old dinners elsewhere. Bishop appeared struck by an inspiration. 
He clapped his cup into his saucer with a sudden bang. "'Hang it, man! You must have been here in the days of Lady Evelyn. Remember her, don't you?' "'Would I be likely to forget?' the captain parried. Out of the tail of his eye he had a flash of Jane Gerson's white face, of her eyes seeking his with a palpitant, hunted look. The message of her eyes brought to him an instant of grace and sore trial. Seven years of Egypt, or of a hotter place, couldn't make a man forget her. The major was rattling on for the benefit of those who had not come under the spell of the charmer. Sir David Cragen's wife, and as lovely a woman as ever came out from England. Every man on the rock lost his heart that spring. Woodhouse, even in three months' time, you must have fallen like the rest of us. I'd rather not incriminate myself, Woodhouse smiled sagely, as he passed his cup to Lady Crandall to be refilled. Don't blame you, Bishop caught him up. A most outrageous flirt, and there was the devil to pay. Broken hearts were as thick on the rock that year as strawberries in May, including poor Cragen's. And after one young subaltern tried to kill himself, you'll remember that, Woodhouse, Sir David packed the fair charmer off to England. Then he simply ate his heart out and died. "'What an affecting picture,' Jane commented. "'One lone woman capturing the garrison of Gibraltar.' General Crandall rose to set his cup on the tea-wagon. With the most casual air in the world, he addressed himself to Woodhouse. "'When Sir David died, many of his effects were left in this house to await their proper owner's disposition, and Lady Cragen has been, uh, delicate about claiming them. Among them was the portrait of Lady Cragen herself, which still hangs in this room. Have you recognized it, Captain?' Woodhouse, whose mind had been leaping forward, vainly tried to divine the object of the Lady Evelyn lead, now knew, and the knowledge left him beyond his resources. He recognized the moment of his unmasking, but the man's nerve was steady, even in extremity. He rose and turned to face the rear wall of the library, against the tapestry of which hung four oil portraits in their deep old frames of heavy gold. Three of these were women. A fourth, also the likeness of a woman, hung over the fireplace. Chances were four to one against blind choice. As Woodhouse slowly lifted his eyes to the line of portraits, he noticed that Jane had moved to place the broad tent shade of a floor lamp on its tall standard of mahogany between herself and the other two men, so that her face was momentarily screened from them. She looked quickly at the portrait over the mantel and away again. Woodhouse, knowing himself the object of two pairs of hostile eyes, made his survey deliberately, with purpose increasing the tension of the moment. His eyes ranged the line of portraits on the rear wall, then turned to that one over the fireplace. "'Ah, yes, a rather good likeness, eh, Major?' He drawled his identification with a disinterested air. Crandall's manner underwent instant change. His former slightly strained punctiliousness gave way to naturalness and easy spirits. One would have said he was advocate for a man on trial, for whom the jury had just pronounced not proven. Scotch verdict, yes, but one acceptable enough to the governor of Gibraltar. The desk telephone sounded just then, and General Crandall answered. After listening briefly, he gave the orders, "'Dress flags,' and hung up the receiver." Fleet's just entering the harbour, signal tower reports, he explained to the others. Miss Gerson, if you care to step here to the window, you'll see something quite worth while. Jane, light-hearted almost to the point of mild hysteria, at the noticeable relaxation of strain, denoting danger past, bounded to a double French window, giving on a balcony and commanding a view of all the bay to the Spanish shore. She exclaimed in awe, ships ships hundreds of them why general what the mediterranean fleet young woman bound home to protect the channel against the german high seas fleet deep pride was in the governor's voice his eyes kindled as they fell on the distant pillars of smoke scores of them mounting straight up to support the blue on their blended arches 
Captain Woodhouse could scarcely conceal the start General Crandall's announcement gave him. He followed the others to the window more slowly. "'Wireless, they'd be in ten hours ago,' the governor explained to his wife. "'Rear Admiral won't make his official call until morning, however. In these times he sticks by his flagship after five o'clock.' "'Wonderful, wonderful!' Bishop turned in unfeigned enthusiasm to Woodhouse, behind him. "'There is the power, and the pride, of England. Sort of thrills a chap, eh?' "'Rather,' Woodhouse replied. "'Well, must get down to the quay to receive any dispatches that may come ashore,' the Major exclaimed. "'Gad, but it gives me a little homesick tug at the heart to see these grim old dogs of war. They represent that tight little island that rules the waves.' ah london london the big old town where they pull the strings that make us dance general crandall leaning against the window frame his eyes on the incoming fleet voiced the chronic nostalgia of the man in the service the town for me woodhouse exclaimed with fervour i'm sick for the sight of her the sounds of her the smells of her the orange peel and the asphalt and the gas coming in over vauxhall bridge Bishop turned on him admiringly. "'By George, that does hit it off, old man. No mistake!' Jane was out on the balcony now with field glasses she had picked up from the governor's desk. She called back through the curtains, summoning Woodhouse to come and pick out for her the flagship. When he had joined her, Bishop stepped quickly to his superior's side. "'What do you think, General?' By George, it seems to me it would need an Englishman to give one that sniff of London this chap just got off. Exactly, the general caught him up crisply. And an Englishman's done it, Rudyard Kipling. Any German who can read English can read Kipling. But what do you think, general? Chap strikes me as genuine. That portrait of Lady Evelyn clenched things, I take it. Confound it! We haven't absolutely proved anything, pro or con. General Crandall grumbled in perplexity. Thing'll have to be decided by the Indian, what he finds, or doesn't find, in Woodhouse's room. Let you know soon as I hear. Bishop hurried to make his adieu to Lady Crandall and her guest, and was starting for the doors when Woodhouse, stepping in from the balcony, offered to join him. The governor stopped him. By the way, Captain, if you'll wait for me a minute, I should like your company down the rock. Bishop had gone, and the general, taking Woodhouse's agreement for granted, also left the room. Woodhouse, suddenly thrown back on his guard, could find nothing to do but assent. But when Lady Crandall excused herself on the score of having to dress for dinner, he welcomed compensation in being alone with the girl who had gone with him steadfastly, unflinchingly, through moments of trial. She stood before the curtains screening the balcony, hesitant, apparently meditating flight. To her Woodhouse went, in his eyes an appeal for a moment alone, which would not be denied. "'You were very kind to me,' he began, his voice very low and broken. "'If it had not been for your help, I would have... I could not see you... see you grope blindly and fail.' She turned her head to look back through the opened glass doors to the swiftly moving dots in the distance that represented the incoming battle-fleet. But was there no other reason, except just humanity, to prompt you? He had possessed himself of one of her hands now, and his eyes compelled her to turn her own to meet their gaze. Once, when they were trying to trip me, I caught a look from your eyes, and, and it was more than, than pity. "'You are presuming too much,' the girl parried faintly. But Woodhouse would not be rebuffed. "'You must hear me,' he rushed on impetuously. "'This is a strange time for me to say this, but you say you are going, going away soon. I may not have another opportunity. Hear me. I am terribly in earnest when I tell you I love you, love you beyond all believing. No, no, not for what you have done for me, but for what you are to me, beloved." She quickly pulled her hand free from his grasp, and tried to move to the door. He blocked her way. "'I cannot have you go without a word from you,' he pleaded. "'Just a word to tell me I may—' 
how can you expect that i knowing what i do she was stumbling blindly but persisted you who have deceived others are deceiving them now how can i know you are not deceiving me too i cannot explain he dropped his head hopelessly and his voice seemed lifeless it is a time of war you must accept my word that i am honest with you she slowly shook her head and started again for the double doors perhaps when you prove that to me he took an eager step toward her but no you cannot i will be sailing so soon and and you must forget you ask the impossible woodhouse quickly seized her hand and raised it to his lips as he did so the double doors opened noiselessly and jamir khan stood between them sphinx-like jane startled withdrew her hand and without a farewell glance ran across the library and through the door to lady crandall's room jamir khan with a cold glance at woodhouse moved silently to the door of general crandall's room and knocked it is i jamir khan he answered to the muffled hail from within yes general sahib i will wait he turned and looked toward woodhouse the latter had taken a cigarette from the case almer had sent him through jane and was turning it over in his hand curiously the indian treading like a hunting cat began lighting candles his tour of the room brought him to the captain's side and there he stood motionless until woodhouse with a start observed him captain woodhouse has been most indiscreet he said in his curious mechanical way of speech woodhouse turned on him angrily what do you mean he snapped is it that they have ceased to teach discretion at the wilhelmstrasse the indian's face was a mask i know nothing about the wilhelmstrasse the white man answered in a voice suddenly strained then it is very very foolish for the captain to leave in his room these plans jamir khan took from his girdle a thin roll of blueprints the plans of the signal tower and room d which almer had given woodhouse the night before he held them gingerly between slender thumb and forefinger woodhouse recoiled the general sahib has sent me to search the captain's room the even voice of jamir khan ran on behold the results of my journey woodhouse sent a lightning glance at the door leading to the governor's room then stepped lightly away from the indian and regarded him with hard calculating eyes what do you propose to do with those plans what should i do the white shoulders of the indian went up in a shrug they will stand you before a wall captain woodhouse and fire it is the price of indiscretion at a time like this woodhouse's right hand whipped back to his holster which hung from his sword belt and came forward again with a thick short-barrelled weapon in it give me those plans you yellow hound shoot jamir khan smiled add one indiscretion to another shoot my youthful fool the door to general crandall's room opened and the general in uniform evening dress stepped into the library woodhouse swiftly slipped his revolver behind his back though keeping it ready for instant use all ready captain smoke the general extended his cigarette case toward woodhouse the latter smilingly declined his eyes all the while on the indian who stood by the corner of the general's desk between the sleek brown hands a tiny blue roll of paper was twisting into a narrower wisp under the careless manipulation of thin fingers well jamir crandall briskly addressed the servant have you completed the errand i sent you on yes general sahib the brown fingers still caressed the plans of the signal tower have you anything to report the general had his cigarette in his mouth and was pawing his desk for a match jamir khan slowly lifted the tip of the paper wisp in his fingers to the flame of a candle on the end of the desk then held the burning tip to his master's cigarette nothing general sahib very good 
Come, Woodhouse, sorry to have kept you waiting. The general started for the double doors. Woodhouse followed. He passed very close to the Indian, but the latter made no sign. His eyes were on the burning wisp of paper between his fingers. End of chapter 15